Hello and welcome to the Lebanese Politics Podcast. My name is Benjamin Red. I'm joined by Nizar Hassan. Hi, Nizar. How's Hello. it going? I'm good. How are you? Uh, I, I am uh, going to collapse very soon. Uh, <laughs> we, we have to make it through uh, Sunday evening and then probably Monday. Uh, and, and then, khalas, we're done. For, we need some for, rest. For, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I think I think everybody's just a little bit tired of, of the election at this point. This, I this agree. is the, the, the bitter Everyone. end here. Um, so we're coming to you right now uh, on Friday night. Uh, and there's a reason that we're actually coming on Friday night. Some of you uh, listeners may be wondering about that. And that's because actually, uh, technically, we go into a media blackout as of midnight tonight. So we are recording this Friday evening. It's going to drop before midnight. And, uh, and and then supposedly the media, any media coverage on Saturday and Sunday until the ballot, uh, like all the polls close, is supposed to just be about the process of the election. Exactly. Okay. And so also it's just a, a cool thing to do to drop something on a Friday night right before the election. So th- this is your this is your uh, preview, the special, the, our election special of the the special elections podcast that we have here. And so first off, we're we're going to go through real quick what happened in this abbreviated week. Uh, then we're going to talk about a little bit of, about like one of my pet peeves uh, that I've been wanting to talk about for a really long time, but have not had the opportunity to. Uh, and then we're going to talk about what we're, we're going to see and, uh, and how we see things uh, shaping up on Sunday and after Sunday. So this past week, first off, the uh, expat voting finished up. So 40 countries around the world, uh, or 39, I guess, voted. And supposedly, uh, according to Gibran de Seal, the foreign minister, uh, he said something like 59%, uh, there was a 59% turnout. So this is actually higher than the 2009 overall turnout. The overall turnout in 2009 elections was 50.6%. So, okay, so we're about 10 points higher than that. But I actually don't think this is that great of a sign because this is, this is the first time that we've had expat voting first off. And second off, these are voters who just registered a few months back to yeah. vote. Yeah. And all of a sudden, only 60% of them are coming to the polls? Exactly. They actively vo- register to vote, which is right. Which is strange that you actively register to vote and then you don't vote. Right. You right, must right. be really disappointed. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think this t- maybe tells us something about what to expect as far as voter turnout goes on Sunday. So we should add in a small caveat here, well, which this is a really small sample size. Uh, some 83,000 people were registered to vote outside the country Whereas inside the country, there's 3.7 million people registered to vote. So take it with a grain of salt, I think. But I, I mean, what do you what do you think? Is, do you think that the the turnout's going to be high or low? Does this bear on that what we've seen in the expat voting? I'm not expecting high turnout at all. Actually, I mean, this is a, a sample. It's not representative, but the fact that it's people who registered um, and they only voted by 60 percent means that. Uh, if they are not excited enough, I don't think people here would be excited enough, especially with all yeah. the negative energy with this electoral campaign that people are receiving. All the billboards, the huge campaigns, escalated political rhetoric, all for nothing, basically. It will all vanish within 20, 48 right, hours. Right, so. right, right, right. And I, I also feel just like the the general sense that I get, and this is extraordinarily unscientific, right? But the general sense that I get is that people just aren't, that excited about the elections? I agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Which which really l- could lead to some interesting things because if there's low vo- voter turnout, then all of a sudden that means there's di- like it, you know some parties benefit from high voter turnout. Uh, you know, like Hezbollah and Amal. You know, they're trying to get high voter turnout in the south so they can uh, take all of the seats uh, and shut out all the opposition. There's some parties that benefit from high voter turnout, and there are other parties that benefit from low voter turnout uh, mm-hmm. due to the dynamics uh, created by the electoral law. Exactly. Um, so anyway, just some other quick process stuff to get out of the way. Uh, we, we also had uh, on Thursday, the poll workers actually went and went to the polls and voted. Um, there were a few small issues with that, like long lines and stuff like that. But the Interior Ministry assures us that everything is fine and things will go off without a hitch on on uh, Sunday. There were also some issues with getting IDs before the vote uh, that is supposedly being addressed with, I think, uh, issuing passports or, or something like that. The the Army, ISF, security forces, they've got all of these plans in place to make sure that no big incidents happen. Um, and in the general sense that I get is that Nobody's really expecting major incidents to happen because most of the main parties, uh, it's in their interest that, okay, the voting just happens without any big 
problem. And there are a lot of regulations now as to which vehicles can move at what time. Uh, you cannot have any car convoys from a certain day to another. I mean, there are all of these regulations to make sure that there are no like real man manifestations or anything that threatens to right, escalate right, into something. Right. And they're, they're also like closing down like nightclubs and stuff like that the yeah, night closing before. Down. So, yeah, you know, like, just night, to make sure that every everybody know to this calm is huge, down. Yeah, closing down nightclubs on Saturday night is just <laughs> huge. It's a political move. <laughs> right. Uh, so, so despite the fact that we're not really expecting anything big to happen, there, there have been a number of small incidents that, uh, that have been happening just uh, last night, Thursday night. Uh, there was gunfire in Tari Ejjide, a predominantly Sunni neighborhood of uh, Beirut, uh, between the Ahbash and the Future Movement. Uh, there were there were rumors that somebody actually died from this, but I think that was not confirmed, but that was shown not to be the case. There uh, perhaps were some people injured, uh, but I haven't heard It's worth mentioning that Ahbash is uh, a faction that is allied with Hezbollah and Amal movement against the future movement in Beirut, right, the second right. district of Beirut. Right. Yeah. So, like, they're they're the the Islamic chair Islamic projects charities or, exactly. or something in, in in English, and like they were sort of like a tool. I, I don't know if a tool is the right way way to put it of of the Syrians when they were here, though. The Syrians they were closely allied with the Syrians, like sort of the. Uh, one of the main Sunni movements that was with the Syrians uh, during their dominance, their political dominance over uh, Lebanon when they were back, you know, prior to 2005. Um, anyway, so so that happened. There there have also been like a number of other small, like just minor incidents here and there happening, fights breaking out uh, and whatnot. Um, but there's also been just like a war of words, right? A big escalation in that. Yeah, huge escalation in, in political tone, actually. All major leaders are on the ground campaigning, have been for the last few days, saying all of these crazy things. Um, <laughs> like, Jumblad's going around Shouf, uh, mobilizing people, saying crazy things like, if my list doesn't win, this is another uh, case of uh, Mukhtara, his hometown and his palace, being surrounded like it was surrounded in 1957, which is a mini civil war that happened uh, between. But the, is this the, Walid saying this? Or yes, Walid, Timur? not, okay. not Timur. All right, all right. It's Walid on the ground, places where uh, PSP has already mobilized, he's going again, uh, just to make sure that people have a motive to vote. Like, that people who support him are voting, rather than changing anyone's mind, because that's not really the case. I think it's not really possible. And Hariri today, uh, mobilizing voters, said, don't vote for those who are accused of killing my father, which is a clear reference to Hezbollah. Right. Uh, what did Nasrallah say? Uh, Nasrallah, uh, a couple days back, I think on Tuesday, he, he uh, not directly, but he basically uh, indirectly accused the future movement of supporting ISIS and Nusra uh, in, in like Arsal and in outskirts uh, of Lebanon. And Jibran Basile also made a speech and I think it was in Akkar saying, uh, vote for those who died for you, vote for the martyrs, etc. Basically, every political party is using martyrs and and like blood and death and the civil war to mobilize voters, which is very um, expected <laughs> a few days before the elections. This is what happens. But yeah, this is their last chance to do it. Like yeah. in, in, in addition to a media blackout going on right now uh, from from Friday night, midnight, there's also a campaigning blackout. Right. Yeah. So like this is this is their last chance. Tonight is their last chance, like theoretically under the law for them to get in all of these jabs. Right. Yep. Um, OK, so. That's what happened this week. I I want to take a minute and talk about something that I sort of my one of my pet peeves or, or one of my pet mm -hmm. uh, ideas uh, that that I haven't had a chance to talk about yet on this podcast, and uh, that's uh, actually relating to Shamil Rukos. Uh, Shamil Rukos is a former brigadier general. He is the son-in-law of Michel Aoun, former army head, and now the president of the republic. Shamil is, uh, Aoun wanted him to, to follow uh, in, in his footsteps and become the, the head of the army, but that was blocked uh, a couple of years back. And instead, Shamil retired and is now going into politics. And he's running for the seat that Michel Aoun used to have in Kesselwain. So Kesselwain and Jbeil are together this, uh, this go around. And Shemel Rukos was basically given, okay, you, you're you going to head up the list for the Free Patriotic Movement, for the Aounist Movement in Jebel and Kesserwain. 
it, and, and it seems that he was given like relatively broad latitude to to do all this, to enter into negotiations and, and put together uh, his slate of candidates that he wanted uh, wanted on his team. Mm-hmm. And so what ended up happening is that the, the slate that they have is it, it's not a an FPM list, honestly. Uh, I, I think last week I, I mentioned something about like the, the advertisements, right? You see the advertisements and it's like, okay, so there's eight different candidates and two of them have FPM branded advertisements. The other six just have totally different, like they're they're not even on the same page. Uh, none of them e- even like mention the Tyar I, in, in most of the stuff that I've seen. With the exception, I've noticed this week, Shamel does have a new billboard out that has a yellow check mark, not the same style as Tyar, but like, or, or sorry, an orange check mark. Uh, on on his billboards, uh, and and he does have like a, a like they've the, got this like sort of '90s or early 2000s clip art of like an orange fist holding the Lebanese flag, mm-hmm. uh, and so so now he has actually put in the in the past week or so put some FPM ish branding on his advertisements, uh, but he's the only one. Uh, the other people on this list like uh, uh, Namat Frim, who is uh, the the CEO of Indevco, a giant company. Uh, uh, global company uh, who's on his list, uh, Ziad Baroud, who is a former, a, a very well-respected former uh, 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 interior minister. He ran the 2009 elections, actually. Uh, uh, you, you've got Mansour Al-Bon on the list. Uh, you, you've got the FPMers, uh, Simon Abiramia. You've got Georges Azar and, and a few others. So this is a very disparate group of people to bring together. So I think that Shamil is in kind of a tough spot with this because he is basically supposed to be coming in and filling Aoun's shoes. And Aoun, when he was elected, especially in 2009, he was elected, they won all eight seats in Jebel and Kesewain. And Aoun was the undisputed leader of the bloc. Mm-hmm. Now Shamil Rukos is coming in and they're not going to win all eight seats to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, and even if he does win those seats, say he wins, uh, he, he does a good show, showing and wins, you know, like four or five seats, let's say. Those four or five people aren't going to be in a unified block behind him. I have a very hard time, you know, thinking that uh, Namat Frim, for instance, is going to be politically beholden to Shemel Rukos once they're in parliament. Mm-hmm. Now, who knows, like there there could be anything, that, that, that any sort of deal behind the scenes, but it, it's... It's hard for me to see that. But I think that all the candidates running with the own sponsored lists are have signed a contract. I don't know if it's verbal or written that they will join the parliamentary bloc after the elections. That's what but I Mansour heard. Bon, but Mansour Bon, Mansour Bon, uh, people think he's just going to join Future because he's not a Tayar person. He is against the Tayar, you know. But is he the share of Tayar on the list? No, no, no. But like one of two things could happen here. Like e- either. Shemel is going to be part of the FPM and potentially a rival for Gibran Basile, who is another son-in-law of Aoun and who is also, who is actually the leader, uh, the president of the FPM. Uh, or Rukos is going to have to like stake out his own path and maybe go a little bit more towards like the March 14th side of things, more towards the LF side of things, which might uh, open the door to like keeping Mansour Bowen with him. Mm-hmm. But I think I, I I think he's in a pretty difficult position though, just because first off, the first thing that he needs to do this is his first political test, and I just don't see how he passes it. Mm-hmm. It, it, it. Everybody is going to compare him to Michelle Aoun, and when they do, it it's not going to look good. I don't think. I I, th- I think you know it, he certainly has a uh, you know if he wants it a long future in Lebanese politics, but I I think. He's in a very, very difficult position right now, and it's hard for me to see how he turns this around in his favor. But who knows? You know, the, the elections are on Sunday. We'll, we'll, we'll have a much better idea of what happens, and especially the relationship between Basile uh, and, Rukos. And, and Rukos after that uh, in, in the you know, weeks following and in the cabinet formation uh, that, that comes after that mm-hmm, as well. Exactly. Okay, so now that I've gotten that off my chest, uh, Let's move on. So what, what you guys have really tuned in for, what's going to happen, right? So um, if, you, if you talk to the experts, the people who do polling and all of this stuff, everybody says basically like the Shiite duo, Amal and Hezbollah, they're going to be the big winners here. Big winners, indeed. Yeah, like the like they're supposed to take 
probably all 27 of the Shiite seats. Yeah, I mean, I think only one of the, seat, on the, of the 27 Shiite seats is in a risky situation. Like, they might right. lose only one out of 27. Right. Which, this, this like, in and of itself, this, we should note, it doesn't look that bad because, you know, like, right now they have, what, 26 out of 27 uh, seats or something like that of the Shiite seats or uh, something to that Close effect, to right? That. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're blocks, Amal and Hezbollah, they, uh, they have... Uh, 26 seats in parliament right now. But the, the real problem comes in with their allies and everything. And so with their allies, so according to, this is from uh, veteran pollster Kamal Fakhali, uh, he expects the Shiite duo to come up with, to end up with something like 45 or 46 seats mm-hmm. with their allies altogether. So this is... And the allies, we talk, we're not talking about FPM, like no, major no. allies. We're right. talking about small figures, small like Ba'ath parties. And Ba'ath, of, SSNP, yeah. uh, Rahim Rad, and West Bekha, etc. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, this, this, is, this is more than a third of the seats in parliament. We have and, 128 seats in parliament. Right, right. So, I mean, this... And, and to me, this, this is just the natural result of, number one, uh, a... A favorable electoral field, and number two, just like really a, a good strategy and a well-executed strategy on their part, I think. Uh, so, of course, then the the question is, who's the big loser? Uh, it depends, right? But yeah. if, if you look at the numbers, uh, definitely the future movement. They're going from 33, 34 seats down to something, you know, 20, 22, maybe 25 if they're lucky. They will be taking a big hit. Now, they, they seem to to think, oh, well, we knew that this was going to happen because of the change in the law and everything, so it's not as bad as it looks. They're, I think they're uh, really trying to manage expectations, and they're doing a pretty good job about uh, about that. Like, everybody knows Future is going to have a much smaller block in Parliament. Uh, because the, the former number didn't make sense in any way. Like, if they had um, an electoral law that made sense, that mm. was actually representing voters, then you would have a different number. 34 is not uh, the size of the future movement. It's, uh, right. it's a very exaggerated, very inflated size. So I think any law, any new law that has better representation than the old one has to give Hariri less less parliamentarians. It has to go down to something that is similar to the other parties. Yeah. Because it's not, it doesn't make sense that Hariri would have more supporters than Nasrallah and, and Birri. Right, and combined. combined. Yeah, it doesn't right. make any sense, absolutely. So this is why I think uh, it, even if it was a majoritarian law, but on d- different voting districts, Hariri would still lose a lot of MPs. I think they understood that. It's just about how Hariri deals with political alliances in parliament. Because he has a smaller bloc, it means that he has less power, less leverage in parliament. He has to form an alliance with someone who has a lot of MPs so that together they can make like a little bloc, and not a parliamentary bloc, but a little alliance that can hold... Um, facing the power of Birri, for instance. Yeah. And so then the other parties, like the, the FPM might gain, you know, a couple of seats. So so they'll be around 20 to 22 seats, probably. The LF uh, it looks to gain, you know, several seats. They, they had eight seats, and they'll probably go up to, like, at least 12. Uh, yeah, that's a big increase. That and is. LF is expected to win, um, to be a winner in this law, because... They are spread all over the country. They are a Christian a political party that has representation in a lot of districts. Yeah, um, it has a history. It has it has a lot of members. And and can I can I just like bang on on this again? Like the LF just ran a really disciplined campaign as mm-hmm. well. Like it was a it was a they they had their strategy. It was a good strategy and it was a well executed strategy. Just like Hezbollah, you know they and and they're they're going to reap the rewards of correctly analyzing the law and uh, and playing their hand, uh, I, I think, in a, a pretty deft manner. I agree, yeah. Yeah, um, so on the other side, we have Kataeb, which is going to go down. Like, they're definitely going to lose seats. They've got five seats. They could go down to as few as two. Probably. Yeah, worst case, two. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, they, they could just also just, you know, lose one or something, uh, end up with four seats. So they, they'll still be around. Uh, Semi Jamal will still uh, have, his, have his block uh, in parliament, but it's a question of how, uh, how strong he's going to be. Um, Merida looks to stay about the same. Uh, Jumblat will lose uh, a couple seats, uh, it seems, go down to eight or nine seats is what the, the experts say. You you're you're very familiar with his home. Uh, That's the home, estimation. Uh, That's the yeah. estimation. Yeah, I mean, uh, it might be less than that, because uh, it just matters who wins on Jumblat's list and how many of them are Jumblat's people. 
and uh, how many are just allies. So it's right. really sensitive. LF and Jumblat, in some cases, Jumblat might lose one MP, like might have one MP less than expected because one of his allies has more than expected. Mm, right. So it's also a matter of competition with his allies. And that's why he's mobilizing now in Shuf and Alay a little bit against Hariri to say vote for our candidates don't for don't vote for Hariri's candidates so that right because they're on the same list so exactly. yeah right right um and then the the big question especially for you Nizar is involved uh, in uh, civil society less down in Shufan Ali uh so how everybody's saying like zero maybe one seat that that's what i'm hearing what what's I'm, your take i'm not hearing zero zero is is really the worst case that can like it would be a I, really... I think by definition yes zero is the worst case <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean zero is uh, um not something to expect because the polls in shuf and alay and the polls in beirut one are pointing at at least one mp for each uh beirut one we don't have polls we don't have money to make polls but the political parties make them and we get the leaks uh, mm. in Beirut first Beirut one we're talking about two MPs now no one is discussing one MP anymore it's just about who is the second MP the first MP being Paul Ayabian she has the biggest chance and then the second MP can be anyone because uh, not anyone but maybe three candidates can have the second seat because uh, you have Nadim Shmail in a very bad position he's not campaigning well uh, if the LF don't give him enough votes, Gilbert Dumit might win if he gets enough votes, which would be a huge upset for Ashrafi, huge upset for elections uh, in this district. I mean, do you, not, do you think that Gilbert has a chance, though? Because not only it's not just him versus Jamail, it's also uh, uh, Pussy Ashkar, right? Gilbert is doing, Gilbert's numbers are very close to those of Ashar and Jamail. So it's really close. It's closer than we expected. And um, like LF has to mobilize a lot of people now to vote preferential votes for Nadim Jmail to save the... Because it would be a big upset for LF to lose it to Aoun or lose it like Masoud Al-Ashar or to lose it to Gilbert Dumit. But if it's not Gilbert Dumit, it's probably either Ziyad Abbas running on the Orthodox seat. He has uh, quite a good popularity in, in Ashrafi or um, Jumana Haddad, uh, mm. the feminist, uh, liberal feminist figure. Um, the third person who has the choice is uh, Yorgi, but his choice, I think, the chances, I think, are lower. Does the does the Twaini list have a chance, you think? I don't think so. You no. don't think so? I don't think okay, so. so I but think for, you're for, you're a little bit optimistic. But... I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic <laughs> that we're getting four MPs, at least, uh, across the country, which is one in Shufale, at least, up to two, uh, two in Beirut, one up to three, and then one in Metan, for sure. Um, this would be four or five MPs, and I think that's a great achievement if this happens uh, it's not for sure because people are not so excited even people who are like pro activists pro like a pro civil society etc they're not excited because they feel that the chances are low they feel that their alliance with the new po political party Sabha is is not very clear it's a bit ambiguous because they don't know we don't know a lot about Sabha it has a lot of money. We don't know where the money is coming from. It's. Um, I think that like uh, Palaya Ubian, uh, for instance, though, like she was, she, she's been a little bit more uh, transparent on our finances, right? Like for a, for instance, a, for instance, she 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 mm -hmm. yeah, as a candidate, like it, it, like she said, this is exactly how much I sp I spent for my ad buy. The um, I'm I'm not sure if she said where the money came from, but like she like it, it is very rare for candidates to come out and and give you actual numbers. On, on money and I saw that from her so I had the impression that she was a little bit more transparent yeah but the party as a whole is not being very transparent with money they were supposed to publish their financial transactions and where they're spending their money all the documents a couple of months back they're not they haven't yet so the last thing we know about their finances goes back to June 2017 um, it's not being very clear not very transparent and a lot of people are worried about that. This and other things. Also, the alliance with Ziyad Abbas and Beirut One is not very popular at all, actually, um, because he's was he was with Aoun till very recently. He broke right. out from the FPM in 2016 after the municipal elections. All these factors, with uh, like well-known Lebanese apathy towards politics, is is turning out to be like. But do you think that like does that does that play in like civil society's favor if there's apathy? Because I think maybe it like. That that makes your job a lot tougher going around and convincing people like no you you should actually go out and vote when people see this you know oh well what's the best case scenario we get a couple of MPs mm -hmm. uh, what's uh, what's going to actually change 
the this proportional uh supposedly proportional system is not really proportional in any real sense of the term you you have all of the same names going back uh, or a lot of the same names going back to parliament you know how how do you uh how, how do you get people out to the polls when they're really they're manifestly will not be that big of a change. There isn't the chance to have that big of a change in the election. Yeah, I think it's very important not to attach a lot of importance to what will happen after the elections if we win a number of MPs. The, th- the point is having... Well, that's the point, right? Oh, that's having... the whole point of getting into power. Yeah, but getting into power is gradual. So we will have maybe four MPs this time, three or four MPs, and then the next time, if we mobilize well, we will have more. I think the main dilemma for civil society activists now is that they cannot be civil society activists anymore. From now on, from Monday till 2022, we will have a completely different political dynamic among activists, among independent activists, because they are all realizing that we cannot be NGOs and individuals anymore. We need to organize ourselves into political movements. So this is the next step for civil society activists. If we have 100,000 votes or 150,000 votes for act for independent candidates across the country, even if we win zero seats, that's 150,000 people who said we don't agree with the ruling class and we support an alternative movement that wants to change things to the better or to a different to a different direction. So I think this itself has a lot of political significance. I think people reluctant to vote need to take this into consideration that it's a moment of political transition rather than anything that will change tomorrow. So we're hoping that this will be one of the factors that increases turnout. And when turnout increases, our chances increase in a positive, like like directly proportional way. When more voters than expected are voting, they are voting for us in most cases, hopefully. I I, I think you are very optimistic, my friend. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're going to find out. We're going to find out on Sunday. After the elections, we'll be back sometime early next week. Once uh, all of the results are in, we're going to come back to you with another uh, episode unpacking it all. We are not exactly sure when that's going to be, but we will let you know on Twitter. Uh, in the meantime, listen to us. Uh, subscribe. We're on iTunes. We're on SoundCloud. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate it. And this has been the Lebanese Politics Podcast. The Lebanese Politics Podcast is brought to you by myself, Nizar Hassan, Benjamin Red, produced behind the scenes by Susan Wilson, and the music is by Omar El-Fil. <laughs>